Welcome everyone to the first webinar of the of this three-part series on energy modeling and um, analysis for better policy making. It is a great honor to be joined by, by so many of you on, on the panel as well as the, the audience. Uh, the purpose of today's webinar is to take a closer look at whether and how energy modeling can enhance policy and other decision making in the energy sector, what are the opportunities, what are the hurdles, and I'm joined by a group of experts who will help us delve into, into the detail of this over the next hour. The next two webinars will take place on the 13th and 27th of May, and please visit our website uh, to book a place. We will also send reminders after this event. We hope you will join us. So my name is Ben Kluis. I'm the Head of Research and Engagement for the Applied Research Programme on Energy and Economic Growth. I'm a Senior Consultant at Oxford Policy Management. I previously worked in the energy industry in a range of economic planning and strategy roles. The Applied Research Programme on Energy and Economic Growth that is hosting this webinar series is a five-year programme led by Oxford Policy Management, or OPM, and it is funded by the UK Foreign and Commonwealth Office. We aim to produce cutting edge research on the links between energy and economic growth. And by pioneering this research, we hope to promote evidence-based programming, policy making, and ultimately help bring the benefits of modern energy services to all. From OPM's side, I'm joined by Simon Trace, who is the program director of the Energy and Economic Growth Initiative, and Jamie Stewart, who is a senior consultant at OPM and coordinator for um, the program as well as the event. Jamie will also help ensure that your questions from the audience are addressed as much as possible in this webinar. So we have an outstanding panel of experts with us today. Eugenia Masvikeni is a renewable energy and finance expert at the Southern African Development Community um, SADEC and its Center for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency, SACRI. Um, SACRI is involved in two EEG funded research projects on multi criteria analysis for energy planning and renewable energy. Dr. Gabriel Anadaraja is an associate professor at the University College London and leads an EEG project on integrated energy systems modeling and specifically energy system pathways for Ethiopia. Marco Baroni is an independent energy expert and lecturer at Sciences Po, who was formerly at the International Energy Agency in charge of the power and renewables modeling and analysis for the world energy outlook. Thuni is an advisor and former CEO of the Power Systems Operation Corporation of India. He is also for most of us more known as, um, the, as, as one of the founders, creators of India's electricity grid. And Dr. Asami Miketa is a senior program officer at the International Renewable Energy Agency, IRENA. She leads modeling and IRENA's work on long-term energy system scenarios for the clean energy transition. So five outstanding people who are extremely well placed to help us understand the opportunities and hurdles for how energy modeling can actually impact policy making. We want this to be an interactive webinar as much as possible. So while you, the attendees, are not visible or audible, please, please ask questions. You will find at the bottom of your screen a Q&A function. And if you click on that, you can submit questions um, throughout this whole webinar. And please enter questions at any time. And Jamie will keep an eye on them. And, and we will stop at several points in time to take rounds of questions. Um, you also have the option in the chat function that you've got down there to, um, to post any comments and reflections, if you like. And from our side, we are putting a few links in there and other pieces of information if you find them helpful. This webinar is recorded and it will be available afterwards through the EEG 
website. So again, um, to reiterate the format of this event will be a range of questions um, to our panel and, and we'll then open it up to questions from the audience and, and have several rounds and we hope to have um, a stimulating discussion on this topic. So to start us off with um, and, uh, and begin this session, modeling is widely used to address planning and operational challenges in the energy and electricity systems. It's also used to analyze the energy transition and wider economic and climate impacts amongst many other users of it. So perhaps starting with Gabriel, if I may, <laughs> from a modeler's perspective, how do you go about making sure that your work is policy relevant? Thanks, thanks Ben. And uh, it's, it's an important question actually, when, when you are doing the research that leading to developing a modeling tools or any report that produces scenarios that are applicable for different countries so to make sure that the, the tool developed as well as scenario developed are relevant to the countries and could be in the policy process. So that is, that is an important part. Uh, the local context is key to make the model policy relevant and to use it to inform energy and climate policies. Uh, as part of this, uh, analyzing inherent characteristic of developing countries is necessary actually to make the model policy relevance and the research work policy relevant and to make uh, effective and uh, efficient energy policies. So the approach we could use is an inclusive approach where the, the, the local experts should be part of the process. So that is important. So in, as part of this, then the continue, continuous interaction and the interaction of wider stakeholders and local experts and policymakers throughout the project is actually important. Or if the model is, uh, if the project is building a model, then throughout the model building process is also important. This is something not limited to a particular activity or something. It, it starts from you know, asking what type of research question the model want to answer. The question should be relevant to the country. Then if you are focusing on demand projects and that should be relevant to the country, if you are talking about model structure, that is key actually in this. If you want to make the model policy relevance, the, the structure is important. If you, if you see, for example, if you are developing a model for Taiwan, semiconductor industry sector, then semiconductor industry is key. But uh, neighboring or nearby country, Korea, electronics industries are key. Or if you go to Singapore, petrochemical industries are key. Or if you see Ethiopia or residential sector, injera making is, is unique there and key and account for substantial amount of energy consumption. So when you develop a model for a country, this local context should be there. The model structure should actually represent it. And then, you know, what type of existing past and present and future energy policies and government committed, whether can you actually incorporate them into this? And also if you are considering uh, technologies, are they relevant? What type of or level of diffusion is possible? Build rate is possible. And uh, uh, whether you are talking about, you know, regional level or local level, energy trade, energy availability, all these should be local context and should have the local knowledge and should be incorporated in it. And the most important part on this Asami, is- if you, if you look at this from an international agency perspective and the modeling you do, how, how do you see this? The, the context is, is clearly different. The audience is different to a, a specific research a country study like Gabriel was talking about. Yes, thank you very much. So maybe let me explain where I'm coming from. So we support our member countries with renewable ambition in the broader context of energy transition. And the role that I have at IRENA, specific role that I have at IRENA, that involves supporting our member countries with improving the renewable energy representation in their long-term energy planning activities. And that covers not only the methodology of energy modeling, but also the governance of planning. And also we support building institutional capacity uh, through training. And my insights are not really coming from the moderator's perspective or the decision maker's perspective, but we are somehow in between. And my insights are based on IRENA's engagement with mainly government planning offices. 
in different countries. And for example, we, we have been organizing the network of uh, energy planning offices uh, to facilitate exchange of experience using the scenarios for policy making. So we collected a lot of uh, insights through this. And what is, um, I think, important is that when, so IRENA is um, actually organizing this network under the Clean Energy Ministerial. So this is a government initiative. And when we thought of uh, creating such initiative, we were thinking of um, um, like focusing on modeling and then like how modeling would be supporting the policy making, exactly the question that we are talking now. But then as we discussed with many um, government planning offices, it turned out that actually um, the mental model that they initially had that modeling supports directly the government like policy making process was not so much shared by the government officials, but rather it's more like the modeling is input, is creating the input to the scenario and scenarios are the main input to the policy making. So in the, in the discussion, we decided to focus on more on the scenarios aspect. And as, uh, as just colleagues just said, institutional aspect is very important because uh, it's, it's modeling is one, but it's really like institutional framework that are surrounding it is very important. And maybe I just want to highlight one uh, main uh, learning from this uh, exchange of the planning officials is that um, when we present, when modelers or when modeling results that are formulated as scenario are presented to the decision makers, it's very important to really clarify what are the purposes of scenarios, because this is often very much confused by the people who are not really in the modern business. And in some context, scenarios are used to uh, somehow project what happens. And other times, times scenarios are more to explore the uh, extreme cases and to explore the uncertainties so that the government can, can prepare for this. So that's one way. Or the, the other type, type of scenarios are more like to raise ambition. Other type is more to build consensus. And sometimes we just uh, backcast from the targets and different ways of using scenarios are somehow uh, model, model builders have good understanding of what these models are and what these scenarios are. But this is very often not very communicated well to the decision makers. And that has been always highlighted as one of the um, important aspects of you know, how the models and model results which are formulated as scenario can be helpful for the scenario for the, for the energy planning uh, govern, government. Uh, Thank you, Sami. You, you touched on, a, on another issue there, which is almost this question, are the results of the models or is it the process of modeling that's, that's more important to policy making. And Marco, I was wondering from perhaps with your former IEA perspective, but also as, as someone who actually teaches future modelers, um, what, what's your perspective on that? You are on mute, Marco. <laughs> Many thanks, that, that helps. <laughs> thanks a lot. Um, it's a very uh, interesting question, and uh, uh, it's very interlinked, by the way, with the previous uh, two ones. Uh, um, and I have to say I agreed with uh, many of the things that were uh, said by my um, uh, colleagues on the, on the panel. Now, I would say the, the most important is uh, to be able to answer the right, uh, um, in the right way the policy question. So modeling comes uh, as uh, a help uh, to this, uh, um, to, uh, to be able to answer this question uh, or these uh, questions, um, I think that that is uh, there is no doubt. Uh, um, uh, modeling cannot be more important uh, than uh, uh, than the pol than the, um, uh, the the answer cannot be more important than the question that, uh, that you're trying to to answer to. 
I think that uh, the point that Azami made uh, about uh, different scenarios is uh, absolutely important in this respect. It's exactly showing, uh, you can build uh, a number of scenarios, but effectively showing uh, where you're going uh, uh, and where you want to, uh, to be going and see uh, where are the gaps uh, and uh, how you can fill the gaps uh, um, with which type of policies is a very important uh, uh, part. Uh, being able to, uh, to, uh, to estimate uh, how the, um, the, uh, the policies can impact our future trends uh, is a very important uh, way to help policymakers to understand. Effectively, a model is just there to answer, uh, uh, to put together different complex uh, questions uh, and try to, uh, to streamline them. Then the, the question is, how do you bridge uh, the, the knowledge of the, uh, of the model to the uh, policymaker and, uh, and make it uh, as uh, more, uh, most policy relevant uh, as possible as you uh, discussed in the first question. And Eugenia, you, you are involved um, through SACRI in, in projects that deliberately have in their title this, this concept of multi-criteria analysis, but you're also in, in this uh, slightly more policy making space. What, what's your perspective on, on this? Um, usefulness of models and the process itself. You're on mute, Eugenia. Sorry. Uh, th thank you very much, Ben. Uh, I think to us, this webinar is particularly quite relevant and important in the sense that, you know, a SACRI, maybe from a, I'll speak about it from the SACRI context. We are a grouping of 16 SADC member countries, and um, we fall under the SADC Secretariat as one of the three implementing uh, agencies. We work alongside the Southern Africa Power Pool, and we also work alongside uh, the RERA, which is our regulatory authority uh, entity. So you find that together we do quite a lot of uh, modeling work. And this is really based uh, on trying to support the uh, policy aspirations of SADAC and the SADAC member states. And uh, we do have the mandate to contribute to increasing access to modern energy services, as well as improving our energy security as well uh, and also to improve uh, the promotion of market-based adoption of renewable energy and energy efficiency technologies. And you find that uh, this is also based on what uh, the national development plans for the 16 static member countries are trying to do and talk to and, um, and in as much as they feed into the SADAC uh, industrialization policy as well as integration uh, integration in terms of uh, ensuring that there's energy access and also to ensure that uh, access rates increase in these uh, can, uh, member countries. So we really realize that there's a symbiotic relationship between our policy making and um, modeling. And the way we do it in SADAC is uh, it's really through a participatory interactive collaborative uh, you know, approach based on uh, the policies that we have in the region and uh, in as far as they link to uh, this, this SADAC uh, umbrella policies. Thank you. And um, how you, you are more looking at this, I suppose, from a policy making perspective and, and actually framing the, the decision process. Um, how, what has been your experience in, in using models either in the India context or, or more broadly? So, uh, thank you first. And uh, uh, scholarly panelists, I am a hardcore practitioner. So let me start uh, with, uh, you know, um, first of all, uh, as a system operator, I was a system operator before becoming the CEO. You can't touch system, power system. You can't smell system. You can't look at the system. You can only visualize it. 
and we have learned to grow with the models we have only to visualize power system through models i remember during 70s we used to have a network model miniature physical model and do the simulation to feel the system so there is no option but to have a model and uh, when we say policy maker we are basically meaning decision makers so even if i am in a let's say today i am the in charge of the system i have to take decisions and i have questions and questions in my mind and how do i get answers so that's where the models are and when we extend of course uh, it goes to energy and so many other things so modeling is essential but we never realized it that it was so essential because we lived with the models that's one part the other part i would say is that yes uh, models uh, does not really mean mathematics or computers or other things the end user has to have a feel of the model whoever is taking decision so the whether how validated is the model how much i can rely on it and is it uh, over complicated is it over simplified is it answering my questions do i have confidence in the answers which the model gives these are the things which comes to the mind but over the period this faculty has so much matured that we take it for granted and the models are pakka and we get the answer for it but as we go along i will uh, explain in my rustic way that how do i feel as a decision maker about the models and this entire Uh, faculty which has developed over the years uh, but uh, issues are many with the models as a practitioner how updated is the model is it answering my questions with the kind of accuracy which i want or the precision which i want and uh, assumptions which has, it has taken the answer of a model will be as good as the assumptions so the assumptions part is uh, extremely important for us and then when we talk of a big model let's say all india model keeping it up to date is a challenge so we have i will talk about it in the subsequent uh, you know rounds that how to keep it up to date while we keep on improving the model but we have to keep on improving the data which we are feeding into the model particularly if it's time series how the from bottom up the model is kept how do we stitch it at the uh, international level and so there are uh, other issues but <coughs> in today's scenario the decision makers and the operators have taken models for granted and they have great faith in it there is no other way to do thing let me stop here Does someone want, from the panel have a perspective on or response to to some of this? Gabriel. Yes, I I I, I support most of these discussions, and uh, I I I really think they say these uh, policy makers or decision makers actually should have trust on the models. That is where this uh, quality assurance is important actually to make sure the model is you know model can contribute to the policy. but on the point on this uh, decision makers have great faith on models uh, that's not probably my experience with uh, you know few interaction in developing countries the question is you know whether these decision makers have enough knowledge on these models and whether do they actually trust the models and also the local researchers so you know the the country like a well developed countries or emerging economies and also in terms of modeling you know very wealthy modeling countries probably the decision makers have faith on models and modelers but that is not the case in each and every developing countries that is where we we had to work a lot with it, uh, with the uh, policy makers and decision makers to to provide them some kind of or level of knowledge on what models can do what type of questions model can answer and the process that we do 
and whether they can they, they should be able to trust it or not and how effectively we can actually communicate you know this uh, the outcome of the model and the usefulness of them for the policy relevance are actually important i think still there is a big gap between these policy makers and and modelers in terms of understanding marco if i if i may i uh, totally agree um, that uh, a model uh, um, that each model is built uh, for purpose. So trying to uh, use a model to answer uh, questions uh, that uh, it was not designed for is not go uh, going to do any good until you upgrade it, uh, uh, change it, uh, adapt it to the new situations. Uh, second point that I totally agree with uh, is uh, we need uh, uh, to have good data. So it, um, uh, models require constant uh, work on uh, uh, data. Um, in terms of faith or no faith to, um, to uh, the results, uh, I have to admit that I can uh, admit, uh, agree with Gabriel, it really depends who you're talking with. But it also depends a lot on the ability of the person. It, uh, it doesn't really, uh, for the time being, I would uh, not go into the details of uh, are you a model developer or a model user? But in the end is, uh, are you able to vehiculate and to make people understand the results of the model? Or first, are you able to interpret them correctly? Because uh, um, sometimes uh, it's, it's already there, the difficulty. And then are you able to communicate it uh, well? And then to use it well for I insist, uh, for me, the, 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 the much of this uh, is for um, policy, uh, for um, energy planning at large and for uh, policy, uh, for energy policy decisions uh, uh, in particular. Um, Eugenia, did you want to come in on that? Or? Yes, please. Um, I wanted to say that uh, energy modeling itself can be a technical and quite complex uh, exercise. Uh, which is done by, you know, uh, uh, energy modelers and maybe to some extent planners. But then uh, the way it then translates into policy is uh, when you actually interpret uh, the results and speak to the, uh, to the policy makers and try and align it with what uh, they are trying to achieve. For instance, for us here in Southern Africa, uh, renewable energy is our priority. So for instance, if you take uh, a modeling exercise that looks at uh, least cost investments, which sort of technologies should be prioritized and uh, you know, to meet your social and uh, economic uh, you know, um, targets and uh, energy access targets, then, then if these speak, things speak to what the policy makers want to hear and you make them part of the process, you find that there is um, better and more acceptable uptake of uh, the modeling process. It also generates uh, some interest in as far as they, you know, they'll be interested in knowing uh, you know, what really goes, goes on in the process. Thank you. Uh, Jamie, I think we've got at least one question from the audience um, that, that relates. I don't know if we have other questions. So attendees, please, uh, please keep posting questions and answers as you see fit. And if the Q&A function doesn't work, uh, there's the chat function as well. Um, uh, Jamie, would you like to highlight some questions? Yes, thanks, Ben. So we've had a question in from Luca Petrarulo, a uh, former colleague of ours at OPM. Uh, I'll just read the question out. So as Mr. Brony said, uh, models are relevant and useful to the point that they answer well the policy question. So my question is, how do you support governments to have clarity and be able to ask the right policy question? To what extent can capacity building of local policy, or to what extent should capacity building of local policy makers go hand in hand with modeling to support, uh, to help with that and increase energy planning sustainability? And I guess that's for all the panels. So I'm not sure if anyone in particular wants to jump in. Asami. Yes, 
Thank you. Um, I, I think I would like to touch upon a bit on like the, the um, linkage between the modeling and the policy making. So there are like different ways that um, modeling influence policy making. The first level is very generic, no? Like uh, general research can, can inform public debate and through public debate, it may influence the policy. So that is more like modeling coming from the research organization. However, there are also like other types of modeling that is done by the government. So different um, government organized modeling activities, different ways, some government outsource and, and hire modeler outside to formulate their scenarios, whereas um, other types of governments actually have modeling capability within the government. And the interaction between the modeling activities and the policy makings are different depending on what kind of uh, modeling activity we are talking about. And if we talk about like research, a type of modeling, um, so we talked about the importance of the process, but I think if we talk about academic research, process may not be that relevant because what is more relevant is probably scientific robustness. And because of the scientific um, interest of the researchers, it can explore um, extreme cases, which maybe government are not really looking into, and that really expand the horizon of the discussion. So it has a very important law as academic institution to generally influence the general debates on, 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 on the policy direction. But at the same time, if we talk about like direct uh, modeling activities that support directly the policy making process as a part of official scenarios or official master plan, it's a bit different, I think. And for this process, it's very important to have the, the, the process, institutional process, the planning governance, that, that's really very important. And again, like based on our uh, discussion from the network, um, there, there are two, two aspects. One is the, how we develop scenarios using model and how do we use scenarios? And on the side of the development of the, the scenarios, stakeholder consultation is very, very important. And South Africa is a shining example of, you know, like doing very um, um, extensive stakeholder consultation. And then on the side of using scenarios for policy making, it's very important to have very good communication strategy and the transparency. And many governments have now come up with a very innovative way to communicate um, the scenario results. Um, for example, like some, some modeling teams that work for government come up with a nice uh, dashboard where you can test different uh, parameters. So, um, so I think it's important not to, to talk just as a modeling activity as one activity, but different laws can be placed for different type of institution that are performing modeling activities. Um, thank you. Suni, I, Gabriel, we will come back to you in a moment, but um, Suni, I'm keen to, to hear your views on, on, on one of the aspects Asami touched on there, which is sort of how does it relate to the capability of decision-making institutions, governments or, or op utility operators to, to have this modeling in-house to answer directly, or to what extent does it rely on, on the external input? Um, what, what, what would be your answer to that? I fully endorse the views as we made, the stakeholders consultation. And you know, I would add that when a model is made, it, one should be able to play with it, of course, by changing the parameters and see whether uh, uh, you know, yourself create it and get involved in it. But uh, there should be also an upfront declaration that this model will not answer these questions. Many a times people feel that once the model, this is also part of the modelers over enthusiasm on the either side that we start looking for answers, uh, which uh, model has uh, never uh, you know, uh, made for. That's one part. The other thing is, you know, it's 
it has to be a continuum of models uh the model uh in different time frames or different type of uh, uh, related um, issues that would be also very very essential for uh, decision makers uh, when they take uh, on only one model because after all models have their limitations and when you take a call you should know where exactly you are likely to miss we've had quite a few additional questions come in um jamie maybe if there's a way of summarizing a few of them and um and have the panel respond yes yeah thank you that so there are a few quite different questions so i guess first uh from simon trace just sort of building on luca's question from the panelists perspective is there much or sufficient capacity support available to help policy makers effectively use modeling outputs or is most such support focused on building the skills of modelers. Uh, we've also had a question from uh, Yanis Papis. Uh, so as Dr. Asami and Dr. Suni mentioned, scenarios provide pathways of future evolution of the energy system. However, in a world full of uncertainties, can the model capture up to date all these changes in modeling assumptions and inform policy decisions up to date? And this is sort of based you know, on the, the idea that a national policy plan can be three to five or even 15 years. Uh, we have a question from Henry Paler from the International Atomic Energy Agency. So it's a nuclear related question. Uh, I think more of a comment really that uh, there are no sort of policy messages or recommendations related to the potential of nuclear to contribute to the decarbonization of sectors beyond electricity. So perhaps if anyone on the panel could speak to sort of the, the relevance or use of nuclear in the future energy systems and then finally different models this is from an anonymous attendee different models present different results even though data sets are the same how do policy makers choose which model best provides answers to their questions so four quite different questions but i think yes. um one on on skills and capacity the second one on how to keep them up to date and perhaps rate related to it, which one do you use if you've got multiple to choose from? And, and the third a, a specific perspective on, on the outlook for nuclear. Um, maybe starting with, um, um, with the skills and capacity point, um, who would like to, to have a go at that? Ben, can I come in? Yes, please. Thank you. I think just to build on, on what, um, I think it was Asami, uh, over and about the issue of uh, stakeholder management. I think what we have also found important uh, is the need for national ownership of these models, uh, a process whereby you actually involve the policymakers in understanding as well as being part of the building process of the models. Uh, we have found that uh, data availability of data tends to be you know, a constraint. So the way we are trying to do uh, in Southern Africa is trying to help uh, countries with uh, capacity building in terms of, uh, in terms of data collection, uh, providing training so that you know, we, sort, we have a sort of a systematic and standard ways of uh, collecting relevant data. We also trying to build capacity uh, for, for modeling uh, processes. Uh, capacity is a big challenge and uh, by bringing together all the countries and providing uh, you know, such modeling uh, you know, training, it, it, we have found it quite useful. Uh, under one of the uh, projects that we are running that you mentioned, um, we are looking at accelerating large scale renewable energy deployment in Southern Africa in trying to bridge, bridge the analysis and application through decision support tools. So through these decision support tools, we are really helping uh, member countries in terms of building models and seeing how they contribute to uh, explaining uh, poly policy questions. And we are also looking at um, how we can actually 
try and identify the least cost uh, options for developing uh, renewable energy projects, particularly wind and solar, as well as prioritizing them. So you find that we, we, we really have to involve them uh, in part of you know, the capacity building our process because there's a skills gap. Thank you. Ami and Marco, you have your hands up. Maybe um, Asami. Thank, yeah, thank you. Um, I fully agree with the importance of the ownership because uh, without ownership of the planning skill, it's very difficult to keep the, the, the plans updated, keep the models updated. You know, many countries sometimes have an issue of like uh, waiting for the donor money to, to, to hire a consultant to do a master plan and then 10, like 10 years they cannot update. And it's very important that the country own the, the, the planning skill. And in this connection, I am aware that uh, African uh, Union Commission is now starting a, a continental uh, master plan development that includes comprehensive uh, capacity building together with the five African power pool. And we are aware of that because uh, a few weeks ago, five power pools have endorsed IRENA and the Atomic Energy Agency as the modeling partner for these activities. So now um, the idea for this is really like to, to, to build the capacity that that country has ownership and we don't have to uh, do everything from scratch because there are many African countries that have very good planning skills, including South Africa, maybe Ghana, Nigeria. So we can build on these uh, shining example of strong uh, countries and we can work together with the with, with, uh, whole um, African countries. Thank you. And Marco, maybe over to you and perhaps you could also address that question of, um, of how to keep these models up to date. With a uh, big pleasure. Uh, first, uh, uh, I completely agree with the Eugenia uh, on the uh, need uh, for the different uh, um, um, for the ownership in the different countries. I have been uh, working with the IEA on a capacity building program uh, in African countries uh, on statistics uh, and modeling, and I just wanted to offer one additional thought to all the uh, the very interesting one that um, Eugenia said, which is. Uh, uh, a need uh, also to coordinate the different parts of models uh, that you often have existing in a country, but uh, where uh, different ministries or different entities uh, um, don't uh, are not uh, coordinated enough or don't talk enough. So the need to share uh, common knowledge, a common uh, uh, database, a common uh, um, uh, a common understanding, so with all the links of the different sectors, I think, uh, was uh, one of the uh, big outcomes of this uh, um, training that I was uh, involved with, uh, I mean, capacity building that I was uh, involved in. Um, in terms of uh, uh, models up to date, uh, um, that is uh, an, essential, uh, an, essential, an essential part. Um, if uh, the model is old, if the policies are old, if uh, the understanding is old, uh, uh, forgive me if I talk about uh, an old understanding, um, but uh, uh, then uh, uh, the, the answers will not be the right ones. Um, it's like uh, starting uh, with data sets uh, that uh, end up uh, in, 20, in 2005 uh, and you don't know what happened uh, in between. Uh, and for example, you don't know what happened uh, in the renewable world uh, because in 2005 uh, or today, the, uh, the, the, the world has changed. Um, so for sure, that is a need. If you allow me, I will uh, also add uh, one thing on uh, nuclear, given that we had a question also on that. Uh, I agree that uh, uh, nuclear can be uh, useful in a net zero um, world for uh, more than just uh, the power sector. And I think though that uh, there is, uh, there is uh, an interest in this uh, respect. Uh, I'm thinking about China for sure, but uh, also Finland, uh, just to give another example. Uh, but we need to see uh, more practical uh, realizations. And then I think uh, that uh, will uh, become uh, more present in models. So what comes first, uh, um, reality of life uh, or um, uh, uh, 
virtual reality in models. Um, Gabriel, you've you've had your hands up for a while. You also wanted to say something much much longer ago. Um, you 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 work across much of this. Um, what what's your view, and perhaps across all these different questions, ownership, um, up to date, which model to choose, and and the nuclear question to the extent you you feel. I just want to, thanks Ben, I just want to share a few points. The first one starting from Luca's question on how do we know if the, the policymakers ask the right policy question to the model. For me, it should be on the other way, whether do we have the right model to answer the questions they have. You know, it is not like you have a model then looking for the right questions. So the decision makers has questions whether then we, we should look for a, the right for a right model to answer these questions. That is the way the, the question should be dealt. The second point is on in-course capacity. That is always important, you know, building modeling capacity uh, among the policymakers and you know in-house models to use. But it's equally or even more important is uh, building research cap cap modeling capacity at research institution, then actually making sure that these researchers and policymakers works together because uh, it's, uh, it's government institution always will find actually to keep the model up to date, version control and all. So the continuous support should be given to research institution and gap between this uh, research institution and the policymakers or the, the, the uh, decision makers should be the ready most and they should interact continuously. That is how this, uh, you know, the capacity building should should actually happen to, to, to. This will also actually help on this keeping model up to date and version control where research institution can actually, uh, you know, do that work actually keeping the model up to date and making sure not only up to date with the data, also the in terms of advancing modeling, you know, the, you know, the, the uh, novelty on the on the modeling side. So that is that is actually key, and uh, and also there was some question on uh, uh, which uh, which model is suitable. I think we, we, we have a range of models from sectoral to energy system to electricity to et cetera. So the, the, the question is what type of research question do policymakers have? Then we had to choose the right model actually in, in this. But on this uh, nuclear, I, I, I don't know, there are different views on this whether you want to take nuclear, you know, more than power sector to play. To decarbonize heat, sec heat sector or anything, because I I do see in the past presentation using nuclear heat, to, you know, uh, to heat uh, industries or even residential heating demand and all. But I I don't think I will be a supporter of using nuclear heat to you know decarbonize residential or industry heating. You know, it's it it has different views on this. Yeah, it certainly does, and and Suni maybe. Um, your perspective also in India yeah. is, yes. is leading on many so, of these questions. Let me uh, try to pick up a few of the questions which were asked. You know, uh, number one, institutions, absolutely essential. And in India, we have statutory bodies uh, created by the Act, and they have the responsibility of uh, planning and evidence-based planning. And they have to keep the models. The regulators uh, ensures that they have the models and uh, the entire detailed procedure for that. In fact, it's a over-engineered procedure, but uh, that's how it is. So uh, that's very essential. Coming to capacity building. Uh, I would add intrinsic capacity building is what is important. There are consultants, there is academia, uh, a lot of people are working on it, but you need people from within the organization as the ownership will come, provided we have intrinsic capabilities. And uh, that's uh, most of the time lacking because um, modeling requires rigor, the tenacity, uh, which uh, uh, many of the people at the senior level don't have that, but then there is no other option. We need to have... Uh, intrinsic capability. I am a staunch believer of intrinsic capability. Sustainability would come uh, for, from that. And then only they will start uh, owning the uh, model. 
see the other aspect i would say is um, you know sometimes the questions are single interrogative questions by the policy makers and um, i feel very uncomfortable with this say for example a question uh, is my grid secure what your model says or can we have 100% re how much should be the storage these kind of questions policy makers or the decision makers ask and you have to you know give a very elaborate answer that these are the assumptions if you do like this then this will be like this and that patience is not there so this is another you know linkage where how do we do so coming back to on the theoretical side they don't want deterministic or probabilistic kind of a thing you know what will happen in 2050 now the visibility itself is not there but still the questions are related to that on the demand i think the question which was asked in the q and a box uh, for example demand forecast our all the models all the past knowledge uh, ha- is uh, reset now post covid the uh, load curves have changed their shapes have changed and uh, uh, you know the uh, societal behavior would change so naturally you know we need to again work on it and um, develop it further so modelers have to uh, you know uh, certainly factor this and do it very quickly because the call has to be taken very quickly so i will stop here thank you um we have a very nice um, final question appearing here um which is is it possible that sometimes decision makers are not asking the important questions um and therefore what is the opportunity here i think that's the opportunity to say one other bit that i would be very interested in is, is related to capacity and it's it's one that's um very much on my mind if i look at my own energy experience as well as um much of the the community that we work with as a research program but but across the board and it's the gender aspect it's is there is there something on gender empowerment both in the modeling community but also is there an opportunity for models to actually help identify specifically how women or marginalized group can um can play a greater role so are we asking are we missing out the most important question and and how about the, the the social side of it um we probably have comment chance for last final comments from a from around the panel if you keep it brief uh, um otherwise i may have to cut it off um does somebody want to start maybe eugenia you're on mute Sorry. Uh thank you. Uh the way we do it uh for our 16 regional member countries is just to make sure that in everything that we do uh we streamline gender uh especially on capacity development that uh you know we make sure that there's fair representation across all countries and uh across both gender and uh it's something that we pay a particular att- attention to and um we have equally seen uh, you know interest from women and men to be represented uh, you know in in the capacity development programs that we run so for us i think gender mainstreaming in capacity development is quite uh, important thank you marco thank you. <laughs> this time i noticed uh, it uh, thanks um thanks a lot um two f- uh, uh, two quick uh, remarks uh, one on the uh, gender uh, side uh, which is more an implication rather than a gender equality but uh, all the part of uh, modeling that uh, looks at uh, the um uh, access to electricity and uh, uh, getting uh, uh, reducing or getting rid of the traditional uses uh, of biomass uh, i think have uh, a huge uh, um uh, impact on the um on the gender um given that uh, in in much uh, uh, of these uh, uh, examples uh, the it's uh, women uh, suffering a health uh, um health problems because of the traditional use of biomass so 
the use of, uh, uh, of models can also uh, help in understanding what can be um, uh, the impact on health, uh, uh, for example. Um, on the other side is, uh, um, are models missing on important questions? And uh, I would say that we go back to one of the initial remarks that we did. Uh, the differences across scenarios, uh, the complex interactions between uh, fuels, uh, um, sectors, and so on, and therefore the ability of models uh, to go back and say, this is your general ambition, but you're missed, you have missed that you need to do this three actions, uh, otherwise the system will simply not work. So yes, I think that uh, models can uh, inform, but still starting from uh, uh, this idea of scenario, um, uh, of scenario analysis and uh, identifying where the main gaps are. The, the hour is up officially, but um, we started a late, so I will suggest we carry on for uh, five more minutes. Um, so I suggest Gabriel, then Sonny and Asami. Afterwards. Okay, thanks, thanks, Ben. I think this uh, the involvement of women actually many times discussed here is stakeholder interaction and inclusive approach. We are actually a decision actually made that can actually affect women's life. Mean they should be part of the decision. So that is important. So women should be part of the decision process in model development, policy making, decision making, etc. Via stakeholder engagement activities. It's not only women and also uh, deployed communities, then men also would be included. It's, uh, you know, we can find in many countries this type of issue. And the second one on this uh, capacity development, whether we should actually involve more and more women in, the, in energy modeling or the energy policy analysis, but we found it's very hard to find actually people, women working on energy study. What we need to do, the action is actually not on the, on the, on the research level or something. We should start this process from undergraduate or master program level, we had to actually encourage women to take on this energy side and energy studies to make sure that, you know, they know and they will be the one sometimes could be affected by or, or benefited or whatever the way the decision made on this side. So we should actually, you know, uh, start from it as early as possible to encourage them so that they could actually choose the right path actually on their career and then the capacity development is possible. Otherwise, very, very hard to find people to, you know, to end their capacity. Thanks, Gabriel. Suni. Yeah, so women in STEM is an issue, but uh, with the you know, IEEE and SIGRE and uh, so many other organizations, now we have fairly good proportion and their presence is felt right up to the board level. So this is on making they are very deeply involved. The other two things I will quickly say is, um, one is the probabilistic versus deterministic. Uh, as a policymaker, I want the tail ends uh, and uh, extreme scenarios. Uh, how many of us uh, could have uh, said about COVID and then the models are working, the results are coming, but we know how it goes. That's the second. The other part is, a multi-cycle, multi-period models, models which run on, on on the whole year, not a snapshots. Snapshots decision making doesn't help. So that's uh, an area where if it is further developed, decision making will become much better. Of course, on the academia side, research side, a lot of work has been done. But their TRL level, when would they come to industry and really help the policymakers is something on which we need to work, need to make understand the both sides. The policy makers and the uh, decision makers should tell that please do this and they should tell us that we can tell you this. So both sides, thank you. Asami. Um, thank you. So we are actually talking about energy transition and decarbonized world. And this is not just like energy change, but implies the whole societal change that has impact on very different type of people, including women. So women is one, one segment, but as um, Gabriel said, that it's not only just women, but it, we have to think of whole social justice of you know, people who lose jobs. So really like important to, to actually um, 
broaden the scope of traditional energy modeling, which were usually not so good at looking at this socioeconomic aspect. And that is one of the recommendations from this uh, dialogue within the um, network that we came up with. So, um, you know, it's, it's very important that energy transition is not the same as what we had before. It's going to be a lot of changes and a whole societal change, and it has to be done in a, in a fair and inclusive manner. So for that, like the moderator should also ac accompany this change and uh, the model should be, you know, uh, expanded to address the important issues more in a comprehensive manner. Thank you so much to all panelists for your deep insights for the conversation just now. I found it extremely insightful. I hope you, the audience as well. Our next webinar will take place on the 13th of May. So in about two weeks time on the topic of how models can best address energy sector challenges and what type of models. And our third one will be on the frontiers of modeling and um, perhaps a chance to go into some of those behavioral elements that Suni touched upon. Um, Registration details have been posted here. We'll also um, send an email after this webinar. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining and have a good rest of the day or evening, depending on where you are. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Bye. Bye. Thank you.